Welcome to this week's episode of Operation Support Local. I'm your host, Derek Fage, and I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to get back to watching live sports here at TD Place. I'm so looking forward, especially to our Ottawa 67s returning to play. Should be another exciting season. And I have another exciting show for you this week. We're going to talk about so many different things, and we're going to start off with a great story where Darling Collins' family business, like so many other businesses, has been impacted by the pandemic, and she had to shut down completely. However, that gave her an opportunity to use her skills in marketing and web design to help her local community. What she decided to do was absolutely amazing, and this became the birth of My Local Markets. I say like left the farmer's farm because they were busy, they were working and they didn't have their foreign workers in that were helping them uh, and they just got slammed. They didn't have online access, they didn't have online websites. I was like, okay, well I'm gonna pick a few people and I'm gonna build a website for them. That's what I'm gonna do with this time off. And then I was like, I'm never gonna be able to help anybody doing that. And that's when I was like, I'm gonna build one website and I'm gonna sell all of their things for them. So there'll be no risk for them. They won't have to pay me to do the work because I will list the items and sell them myself and I'll just let them farm and I'll sell. And we thought it was going to be a very temporary thing. Uh, it was my daughters and my husband and my son and we were like, okay, we're gonna do this, we'll do these deliveries, this is how we're gonna help people and keep busy while this is going on. And our first week we got 22 orders and that was April. So the website was live April 17th. That week we got 22 orders. The following week it was 80 and it just climbed very, very rapidly. You almost want to say it's like a local Amazon a little bit. You just go on and you search for the items that you're looking for. Uh, they're identified by vendor as well as by products. So they'll say local vegetables or bakery or gifts and these types of things. Uh, you add to cart and you check out and that's it. So everything goes into one cart. And that was really important. I did try to help out some of the farmers markets in getting online. And being that they're a nonprofit, they could not amalgamate all the money into one spot which becomes a deterrent for a customer because then you're buying a cucumber from this person, a bar of soap from this person, and you're checking out three or four times through the process, which doesn't make it very easy. So we wanted it to be as easy as possible. Put everything in one cart, check out, choose curbside or delivery and have the products delivered. We're just over 80 vendors right now. Uh, Sheena's got a working list. It's really about how quickly we can get them on and how quickly we can get their products on board. Uh, but we're going to keep growing. We're not, we don't exclude anybody. So you might find, you know, 17 different versions of bath bombs uh, because really this is about being as collaborative as possible and including everybody and just helping them get their brand out into the market in another avenue. So today we have five drivers coming and we've split the orders over two days. We, we a little bit less for today because you guys were coming, uh, but they will come and they pick up their orders, usually about 14, 15 orders per driver. And these are the drivers, several of them used to be my technicians for our fire protection company. Uh, one has been with me for over 10 years, so we've been able to hire some of them back, at least on a part-time basis right now, which has been wonderful. And they pull up uh, in half an hour intervals and get their orders loaded into the vehicle and, and off they go. Even vendors who've had delivery up until this date have started opting for curbside because they just really want to chat and say hello and, and come pick up their items. So we do curbside from both our Nepean location and this location. We're on the Kempville campus. So North Grenville purchased this from Guelph University, I can't tell you how many years ago, but several years ago. So there's many different people that have rented out different space. There's still tons of vacant space here on campus, but it's beautiful grounds and trails. We are now going to be opening on Friday afternoons, every Friday afternoon. Uh, we're looking at opening on Saturdays also, but we get some bikers come by uh, that are using the trails and they give a little knock on the window because the door is closed and Kara will open it up and say, well, this is what I have right now in terms of fresh produce and anything that's on the shelf can go because we order weekly from our vendors. As long as people want it, absolutely, but I think that will keep changing as, as the need happens. I mean, I want to keep supporting our small local businesses. I want to keep trying to share their stories and talk about their brands and get their product out and let the makers make and I'll sell. <laughs>
Reporter Julie Buen had a chance to catch up with them to find out how they've continued to support the most vulnerable in our community. So the Ottawa Community Foundation is a public foundation. We are at least two things. We're a funder of the charitable sector. There's 1,800 charities in Ottawa. And we're also the alternative to private foundations. So philanthropists that want to give through a private foundation will choose us instead of selecting their own private foundation infrastructure. So 1,800 charities, uh, we're the only funder in the city that covers the full spectrum of causes. So certain funders are actually focused on certain causes like healthcare or environment or animal rights. We cover the full gamut of causes. And one for an excellent example is Wabano, right behind us. Uh, an excellent indigenous center for community and healthcare. Uh, and we've been working with Allison Fisher for as long as uh, Wabano's been around and as long as the Ottawa Community Foundation's been around. A very specific uh, example of a a program we've been funding for the last three years is an Indigenous learning program. They've brought about five to six hundred kids, high school and elementary kids, through the program annually for the last three years. And it's an Indigenous-led and an Indigenous-taught program to facilitate truth and reconciliation in our city. As a CEO, your approach shapes how other people think about the pandemic. How would you describe your stance? So the pandemic, a once-in-a-lifetime I'm going to call it opportunity. Um, we have one of two choices, in my opinion, as a sector. We can crumble or we can, you know, rise up and orient ourselves to address fault lines that are very obvious when systems are stressed. And I choose, of course, to prefer the, the, the latter option versus the, the former option. And we've seen fantastic examples. Uh, during the pandemic, we were probably the first, or at least one of the first foundations in the country to establish a rapid response fund. Uh, we also work with the federal government and others in order to establish an emergency community support fund. And together we've distributed in the last five months over $4 million to over 180 um, organizations, um, touching tens of thousands of our citizens. So we were there to fill a gap, to provide early money, and to orient the money around what we refer to as positive, systemic, sustainable change. So what was the social landscape in Ottawa before the pandemic to what it is now? Prior to the pandemic in our city, right, the capital city of the greatest nation in the world, we had 60,000 households that suffered from some form of uh, food insecurity. Uh, 42,000 monthly users of food banks. Uh, 12,000 households waiting for affordable housing, over 7,500 annual users of emergency food banks, or sorry, of emergency shelters, 13.1% uh, youth unemployment, etc. So these were the numbers prior to the pandemic, so obviously those numbers are just worse. So we're all about creating the conditions to invest in social infrastructure to ultimately drive those social economic indicators in a positive direction. What have you learned about Ottawa organizations through the pandemic? So unprecedented level of ingenuity is what we've seen during the pandemic. Um, for six years, being the CEO of the Ottawa Community Foundation, I kind of promoted innovation and out of the box thinking and systems oriented approaches to solving problems. And I don't want to say to my surprise, but I was thrilled to see the ingenuity coming from the organizations within our city during the pandemic. So they didn't need any help from me or from us in order to facilitate and foster uh, orientation around innovation and ingenuity. And there's a few excellent examples, but I'll talk at least about one of them. So there's this not-for-profit called Food for Thought. Food for Thought started with a charity that was doing some net cafe work. So they were offering free uh, internet access and Wi-Fi uh, and some food services to a community that's marginalized in the Caldwell area. And they partnered with some professional restaurateurs who had to close during the pandemic. And they started delivering hot meal services to people in need in our city. So in our city, I think I mentioned already, there's about 7,500 annual users of emergency shelters. A good chunk of people are actually staying in shelters that don't have any cooking facilities. So you've heard of in Ottawa, the city is using motels. So other than a microwave and perhaps a little refrigerator, there aren't really any cooking facilities. So to my amazement, I went to visit uh, Food for Thought just uh, in the last two weeks. 
uh, they're up to about 60,000 hot meals served during the pandemic. So my view is this is not only an opportunity for ingenuity, it promotes systems oriented thinking. It's a fantastic example of cross sectoral partnerships, public, private and philanthropic. So restaurateurs, the city, uh, agencies, not for profits, etc. cetera, uh, in order to deliver a service. And my hope is this will be a fully baked element of our social infrastructure to deliver food services forever. So the big question, how hopeful are you for the future? I am absolutely hopeful. You know, I tell people that I'm in my vocation and uh, I chose this as my vocation because uh, I volunteered as a, a Fortune 100 CEO in this charitable sector and was motivated and inspired every day. And now I'm motivated and inspired every minute of every day. So I was hopeful prior to the pandemic. We've just talked about some innovations and some out of the box thoughts and some opportunities for infrastructure, you know, investment that's going to yield driving those negative numbers to zero and those positive numbers to 100%. I'm full of hope and I hope the community is full of hope and we hope that together uh, our city is going to be the best city it can possibly be. Next up, we head to Almont to the North Market. Well, like so many businesses, they've had to change the way they do business. They've gone from a coffee shop to a bodega. So they're still doing sandwiches and soups, but now they're also doing some specialty grocery items and even biodynamic wines and beers. I have no idea what that means, but we'll find out right now. My name is Amanda Herrera. I am the chef and owner of uh, North Market Cafe here in Almont on Mill Street. And we have a cafe that is now a bodega. So our business plan during COVID-19 has changed entirely. We were a 36 person sit down restaurant uh, running lunch, brunch and uh, dinner a couple of nights a week. But with all the restrictions that came into place to uh, you know, be safe during COVID-19, we've totally changed our format and have become um, a, a market, a bodega, a grocery store. A bodega does a lot of in-house products as well. So we have a deli counter that has a, um, a lot of sandwiches and salads by the scoop. But we do our own products like dips and salad dressings and sauces. And we also have a pretty wonderful wine collection as well. And that uh, does definitely lend more to the bodega feel and less to just a grocery store. Rick, my co-owner, um, has done a really wonderful job of curating some very interesting products. Um, we are trying to, our best to bring in biodynamic, organic and natural wines, no, though not everything is. Biodynamic wines and organic wines, you're talking about the farming process. Um, biodynamic it means that along with the grapevines, the, they'll be farming sheep, goats, chickens, um, other types of fruit and vegetables. And what that does is it brings in and creates an ecosystem that is um, it's just ideal. It's, it's a better farming practice and produces, in my opinion, superior products. Our beer and cider selection are mostly Toronto and Prince Edward County based. One of our cider companies is coming out of Guelph um, and they're all super exciting. Um, not your typical run of the mill uh, product that you'll find at, at most LCBOs and beer stores. So we do have the Dairy Distilleries Vodka in their tiny little cute bottles. Uh, so we have those coming in. We work with a company called Ital Foods, which is based out of Carp as well. And um, we work with about five different farms at any given point in time. So we are retailing some of their produce as well in one of our fridges. Once the COVID pandemic kind of took over, um, what I found first happened was all of the restaurants, especially within Almont, started talking more than they ever have before. We started lending each other products when we got shorted by you know, the, the shorts that happened when, uh, when COVID hit. And uh, we've all been able to work together very well, provide a lot of support, purchase from each other, and just touch base with one another, one another uh, on a regular basis to make sure everyone's doing all right and see if they need any help at all. 
The community outreach after we reopened as North Market and dropping the cafe has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, people are coming in every day and using us as a grocery stop, but also to elevate their own meals. Um, they're coming to us not only for a cup of coffee and a sandwich, but they're now getting things to take away to make their own meals at home. So the response to all of the social distancing and the mask wearing and everything like that has been received very, very well by our community and our patrons. Um, we continue to do safe practices as best as possible. We're in constant contact with the health unit as well to make sure that what we're doing is up to protocol and above and beyond when it can be as well. Uh, we care a lot about our staff and our families as well and everybody has a different circumstance that they're in and we're trying to keep our staff and our staff's families safe and our community and the patrons that come in here tend to really understand that and we haven't had any issues with that. And yeah, just everybody keeps playing the same team and uh, it's all going to work out okay. You know, it, it does very much feel like business as usual. Elmont is a tourist destination, definitely, and we've always found that on weekends in Elmont we're very busy. That's still the way it is. So we are focusing right now on opening hours during the weekend, uh, hoping to open up more, get back up to our seven days a week, which would be wonderful. We'll do that over time. Uh, but people are coming out. They are local. They are coming from afar. Some people are coming just for us or just for places like Dairy Distillery. Um, and other people just want to come and be in a town where they don't feel suffocated and they can walk around safely and people still stop and say hello. Well, normally behind me here at the football field here at TD Place, you'd see coaches talking and preparing their players for the next game. Well, we're going to be talking about coaches, but coaches who are preparing people for the battle of their lives. I'm talking about cancer coaches at the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation. We catch up with cancer coach Patricia, who describes that in any given circumstances, both the diagnosis and treatment for a cancer patient is difficult, but imagine going through it during a pandemic, the type of isolation that you go through. And Patricia doesn't just deal with the patient themselves, she deals with their caregivers and family members. So my role as a cancer coach is to work with people who have been diagnosed with cancer or their families. And all of the coaches are regulated health professionals, so either social workers, nurses, um, but we all have experience working with uh, people with cancer, so in oncology. So my background is nursing and I've been a nurse uh, for many, many years, uh, primarily working in the community, home visiting, doing outreach, outreach doing education, um, and most recently working as a cancer coach. So what we know when people have a diagnosis of cancer, it's hugely impactful for them and for their families. So as I mentioned, we coach not just the person with cancer, we, we also have clients who are caregivers. Um, and so that might be the person that we're, we're working with. But what happens with coaching is we will spend some time getting to know them. They will come in and tell us, how is this impacting them? Because it's very, we're all unique people and everybody's very different. So I can see three different women who have, a, say, a diagnosis of breast cancer and how the uh, cancer is impacting them can be very different. So we start with that. So for one person, it might be they're just overwhelmed with their choices about their treatments and what's going to happen. And so they really want to talk about uh, getting more information or help help making decisions about that and space to do that. But another woman, it might be, how do I talk to my kids about this, right? Because this is going to be, be very impactful for them. Another might be, how do I manage work and cancer treatment? So coaching starts with, how is this impacting you? And where do you want to go with this? And so we work together. It's not me just giving them advice or telling them what to do. It's getting to know them, asking good questions, listening to them. And from that, we kind of sort of see, well, what's important to them and where do they want to go? And then together we develop a plan, an action plan, we call it, about what are some next steps that they can take and what would help them get there. So that's kind of what's happening in our coaching session. It's really talking and asking questions. And then hopefully um, when they leave, they have a bit of a plan of next steps to do. And what happens with that, they often come in just feeling so overwhelmed, 
right? It's just too much. They don't know where to go. But really, they often have a lot of strengths and resiliency. So that with the coaching session and you're talking to them about all this stuff and simplifying and asking questions, they leave with a bit of a plan. So they leave often feeling a little more relaxed, um, like they have a little bit of that control back because cancer takes away a lot of your control. So they might feel, OK, I know what I'm going to do next. I feel like I've got some next steps. And that can really help with their stress might you know improve their quality of life well the impact of the covid pandemic has been huge for cancer patients um, and uh, we've seen that evolve and it's different again for everybody but um, especially at the beginning when uh, in way back in march we were you know when the city was trying and the hospitals were trying to adjust to all of this so many things got just shut down so I was working with clients who had been diagnosed and told they need surgery to remove a tumor and that was put on hold. So can you, if you can imagine the fear and the anxiety that those people were living with. Um, not, and, and at the beginning there was no end date, like we didn't know how this was going to go. So there was a lot of fear. So a lot of things were cancelled or delayed and, and that was really, uh, really difficult. Some of those things have come back and most of those early clients have, have had surgeries. But what's, what hasn't been happening and, and the fear is what we're going to find out in the months and years to come is people um, who aren't going to say their doctor because, you know, where normally if we see a little lump or something different on our skin or we're having some stomach problems or whatever, we're going to go to our family doctor and get that checked out. Because of COVID, a lot of people are avoiding doing that. And so what we're, the fear is that uh, cancers are going to be diagnosed at a much later state. Our clients, even pre-COVID, some of them were immunocompromised or just had a lot of fatigue and side effects. So we were doing some appointments by phone and video already. We have the technology, thanks to a great, very generous donor. We got the technology to do video conferencing or video um, appointments prior to COVID. So uh, I would say prior to COVID, I was probably doing about, but this is very rough, but 25% might have been about either by video or phone, and the rest were in person, which is always preferred. <laughs> um, we switched to solely video and uh, phone calls, but because we had the technology, it was pretty seamless. Like we were very comfortable doing that. And so it was just a matter of getting the clients a bit more comfortable, but they've really um, jumped on that. So that's been re really good. We were very fortunate that we were set up and ready to go right from the beginning. So COVID, of course, has had a huge impact on donations. Uh, our organization relies solely on donations and fundraising. And, uh, you know, like everything else, a lot of stuff stopped. So we had, you know, we had some major events that were planned and those had to be canceled. Uh, people who uh, maybe might have been donating at other times, again, this is a tough time for everyone. So donations aren't where they normally would be at this time of year, so it's had a huge impact. I want to remind you that the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation relies on private funding and of course they've had many of their events cancelled or rescheduled to later in the year and perhaps into next year, so please visit their website and donate if you can. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of Operation Support Local. Make sure you tune in each and every Friday at 7.30pm and if you have a story idea, visit our website.